Um, have you got a Bible there? You can start by turning to Philippians chapter 3 for me this morning. We're gonna, I want to spend a few weeks dancing around what I think is a really uh, full passage of Scripture, something that the Apostle Paul wrote. Uh, you probably heard many sermons out of this. They're, 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 they're well-known verses. But I want to spend a few weeks and just unpack a few different portions of them. Um, has anyone ever seen the movie City Slickers? The old Billy Crystal uh, movie, City Slickers, about a bunch of, of city guys that uh, get a bit twisted up in, in city life and, 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 and decide to go on a trip out into the country and herd a bunch of cattle in the sort of hope that that would bring them some rest and uh, you know, bring their, their heart rates down and, and a new perspective on life and so on. It's one of my favourite films, but there's a particular line in there that I love, and that is when Billy Crystal's riding on his horse and it's just a scene with Billy Crystal and an old leathery skinned cowboy Jack Palance plays this guy called uh, Curly and the two of them are riding alongside and they're talking about life and, and Curly says this to Billy Crystal's character he says you city folks spend 50 weeks of the year getting knots in your rope and then you think two weeks up here will untie them for you and he looks at Billy Crystal and he says you know what the secret to life is and Billy looks at him and he goes no and he says puts a finger up and goes this and Billy Crystal being Billy Crystal says, what, your finger is the secret to life? He says, no, the secret to life is one thing. And he says, you stick to that and everything else doesn't really matter. He didn't use those words. He's an old leathery cowboy, but that's the church version of what he said. He said, if you stick to this, then everything else doesn't really matter. And then Billy Crystal says, well, what is that? What's the one thing? And he says to Billy Crystal, he points the finger at him and says, that's what you've got to find out. That's what you've got to find out. Here's a question for you. What was that one thing for you before you came to faith? What was that one thing that you committed your life to pursuing? What was the dominant driving force? What were you chasing? What were you trying to find yourself in before you came to faith? What did you want your life to be committed to? What did you want your legacy on your tombstone? What did you want them to say? He was or she was blah. If somebody walked past that headstone, what would that headstone point them to that your life point others to while you were down here? Is it popularity? Are we pursuing popularity? Do we want to be popular? Sometimes being popular it means that it's so important to us that we will lay aside our convictions if it means gathering or maintaining or building our popularity. We're prepared to compromise on things if it means chasing popularity. And even before we became Christians, we probably all had a sense of conviction, things we thought were wrong and right, and there were still things that we did that we knew were wrong, even when we weren't Christians, who, who did things that they knew were wrong, even though they didn't have Christ in their life. Four of us. Wow. This church, the more I preach here, I think we've just cracked the holy jackpot. You know? I'm, I don't even think we need a church. You guys just, let's just fill the world with the presence of God. Maybe it was a career. Maybe you chased hard after your career. That was what life was all about. Maybe it was money. Every decision, everything revolved around money, money, and more money. Maybe it was sport. Here in Australia, a lot of people, that's what they chase. Their, their dream is sport. Their desire is sport. Their whole weekend is spent watching sport, playing sport, doing sport. It's sport, sport, sport. Maybe it was music. I remember before getting saved, I wanted to be a singer in a rock and roll band, long-haired 90s rock band, 80s rock band, rock and rock and rock. That was my goal. That's what I wanted. Either that or to play rugby league for the Balmain Tigers. Now called the West Tigers. And at 52, I probably could still make the team based on the way they play. <laughs> Maybe it was gardening. Maybe you love to get out and your gardens were the best in the street and you wanted everybody to drive past your house and recognise your green thumb. Who's got a brown thumb here, by the way? Anyone kill everything they touch yet? Good. It's not an anointing, by the way. Painting, maybe it was painting, maybe it was art, maybe it was socialising with friends, maybe it was family, maybe everything revolved around family, family was number one. Uh, a lot of people on my, uh, my, my extended family, my relatives, particularly on my mother's side, family is, is so important, so number one, family should be, it should be really, really, really important to us. And in Philippians chapter 3, Paul gives us a little bit of an insight into his life prior to finding Christ, and a little bit of an insight into maybe what might have been his one thing, what might have been the thing that he was pursuing. Philippians chapter 3, verse 3 to 6, Paul writes this. I thought I could do it without my glasses, but I can't. 
He says, For it is we who are the circumcision, we who serve God by his Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and who put no confidence in the flesh. And then he says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence. There's a bunch of people going, um, you know, we're really close to God, we're tight with God, uh, you should listen to us and here's our uh, spiritual credentials as to why you should follow what we teach and listen to what we say. And Paul often came against this, didn't he? In different churches he would go to and there would be groups of people that would come on in and they would lay out their credentials and some of them would challenge Paul's credentials. Who does this guy think he is? Well, Paul, sort of a little bit of tongue-in-cheek here, he lays out his credentials. He says, well, you want to know who I am based on their standards? If they think that, that being a good Jew or being a, 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 a righteous or whatever is really, then let me give you my credentials that I'm sure will outstep and outstrip any of their credentials. And then he goes on, he says, um, if anyone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Not everybody in these, these groups that were coming into different churches and speaking against Paul, not all of them could boast that. Many of them were proselytes. They were Greek, uh, uh, Greeks or, or foreigners who had been uh, converted to Christianity and then got circumcised later in life. Paul says, no, I was there on day eight. Day eight. Day eight. He says, I was of the people of Israel. I'm not a blow-in. Oh, you can trace my lineage. I am directly of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. And the, and the tribe of Benjamin, if you go back in the Old Testament, there are many great uh, uh, feats and great things attributed to the tribe of Benjamin. He says, I was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. In regards to the law, I was a Pharisee. In regards to the law, I was a Pharisee. In other words, I, I didn't just know stuff, I knew stuff. I didn't just read the Bible, I read the Bible. I didn't just remember a few verses, I knew entire books of the Bible. I didn't just know the, 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 the famous verses that a couple of prophets said, I knew all of what the prophets said. I was that deep in this. I knew my stuff. As for zeal, these guys think they're passionate about God. Let me tell you what I used to do. I used to go around and literally take the lives of Christians for God. I believed I was doing it for God. So there's my credentials. And when I read this list of the things that he, he says, if I had confidence in my flesh, here's what I would have confidence in. Circumcised on the eighth day, I'm an Israelite. I'm the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regards to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, I was faultless. In other words, I dotted every I, I crossed every T according to the Jewish religion. So these guys think they got it, man. Look at me. These guys have got nothing to boast of. If we're going to boast that way and talk about human accomplishments and how, how quickly and deeply we've dove into this religion, he said, these guys have got nothing on me. These guys have got nothing on me. So Paul's one thing, I, I get this picture here, that, that Paul's one thing was actually for him religion. His one thing was his religious beliefs. And sometimes I think Paul gets a, a, a bad rap. Sometimes, sometimes I think we, we think of you know, Saul, the persecutor, an evil guy. I believe that when you, when you read the life of Paul and you listen to his writings, I believe that even as Saul, he thought he was doing God a favor. He genuinely thought he was doing the God of Israel a favor by killing this sect. He just didn't quite get it. He just didn't make the connection. Where does Jesus fit into this religion that I've devoted my whole life to? So he's one thing. He's one thing. And if you understand the training that you had to go through and the commitment to become a Pharisee, it's very clear that his one thing was his religion. He was sold out and committed to his religion. I reckon there'd be a lot of Christians today. And if I asked you, what was your one thing? Maybe you were brought up in the church. I reckon there'd be a lot of Christians who would say a similar thing. My number one thing is my religion. It's my religion. I dot every I and I cross every T. I was born... Mother gave birth to me on the back pew before the ambulance got there. She was so committed to church. Her waters broke. She said, I don't care. We're going anyway. Pack the bags. Dad packed the bags and took us there. I was born right there. Prayed over. Wasn't even out. Hadn't even cut the umbilical cord. The Holy Spirit, they prayed for me. Filled with the Spirit. Never missed a Sunday. Was there every Wednesday night, every Friday night. Prayed every day of my life. Read every, every day with Jesus thing you can find. Never skipped a day, and if I did, I went back to it and caught up. Committed to their religion. But here's the thing. He goes on in verse 7 to 11. After he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, Paul's one thing changed. Changed dramatically. He says, but whatever were gains to me, all these other things that I just told you about, whatever was a gain to me, I now consider it loss. Watch what he says, for the sake of Christ. That's all loss. All that religious stuff I chased is nothing for the sake of Jesus. For the sake of Christ. 
And what, what is more, I consider everything a loss. Not just that, not just the, 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 the number one thing I chase, but everything. I consider everything secondary. I consider it all to be loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Think about that statement. Does that resonate with you? Is that a part of our world? When we think about Christianity in the West in 2024, can we say that that's a part of our world, that, that, that the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord? The surpassing worth, surpassing value. There's nothing greater. There's nothing more important. There's nothing that holds greater significance in my life than getting to know my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul, Paul's a Christian by this point, by the way. But he's still saying that, that I want to know Christ. I haven't got there yet. I haven't arrived. And I still want to get to know him. It's not like when, when imagine getting married. On your wedding day, and you know, me and my, well, Jackie's not here, you have to p- pretend to be Jackie. We walk down the aisle, we look each other in the eye. It's like that married at first sight thing, you know? That show? The first time they see each other is on their wedding day. And they see each other and they say, I do an exchange vows. Then imagine if they just from that point then had the wedding ceremony, then they just went separate ways and had nothing more to do with each other. There was no communication, there was no expression of love, there was nothing. It was just no relationship. It was just, hey, we, we met each other once. I wonder how many of us met Jesus once. We've met him, but have we got to know him? Has our one thing changed, or are we still chasing the same things we chased before, but we can't attack Jesus onto that? It's good to know Jesus, because we all know that there's a heaven and, and a hell, and, and, and you know there's, all, there's different biblical interpretations of that. I don't want to get down into all that, but we do know there's an eternity with God, an eternity separated from God, and the way we get in there is by grace through faith. It's not our own works. So we're saved by grace. So we lean on the grace of God. We get our fire insurance, and we go, now that I've got that, I'm going to take it home, put it in my drawer. It's like a get-out-of-jail-free card in Monopoly, you know? You win a get-out-of-jail-free card, you just keep it. You don't do nothing with it, you just hold it, and you know. One day when I get sent to jail, I go, hey, don't have to go, boom, there you go, just because I've got the card. We can be like that with our faith. Well, I've got Jesus, I've got my fire insurance. It really doesn't matter what I do between now and then, I've got my fire insurance. But Paul's saying there's way more to that than that. He's saying, I actually want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. And the Greek word for know means not just to know mentally and intellectually. Maybe God's doing that to some of you. Maybe he's chasing you. (laughs) Maybe he's chasing you. Came to faith and then that was kind of, that's it. I was introduced, we shook hands, we got married. But I don't really want to pursue any sort of intimacy with you. I haven't got time, nobody got time for that. Well, Paul's saying here, "This this is my one thing. I want to get to know Christ. Look, I've planted churches all around the world, but you know what my one thing is? I want to get to know Christ. I've raised the dead and healed the sick, but you know what my one thing is? I want to know Christ. I've preached some of the most powerful sermons and been in prison for Christ and and persecution and suffered loss, but you know what my one thing is? I want to know Christ. And not just an intellectual knowledge. The word know in the Greek, is it, it includes knowing up here, but it also means knowing in here. It's an experiential knowledge. It's, it's the same word used when, when, when it says that, that, that Joseph never knew Mary when Jesus was born. He never knew her. It's the same word. He never had that intimate connection with her. There was no consummation. Yet, yet Paul says that, you know what, my, my one thing has changed. There used to be these things. Now my one thing is I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage. The Greek word there, garbage, literally means the refuse. It's gross. He says, that's how I see all these past achievements and past things. They mean nothing now because now I'm chasing Christ. I want to find everything in Christ. He says, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. Hang on, isn't Paul already a believer? Yes, he is. Yes, he is. He's a Christian, but he's going, but you know what? It's not just about shaking his hand and a wedding ceremony. It's about a marriage. It's about walking daily in union with the one that I've betrothed my life to and the one who betrothed their life to me. That I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. In verse 10, 
I want to know Christ. Point blank. He's like, let me summarize everything I've said. Here's the deal. I want to know Christ. But hang on, Paul, don't you know Christ? Yeah, I know Christ, but I want to really know Christ. I want to keep knowing Christ. He's my one thing. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death and, to so- and somehow attaining the resurrection of the dead. I want to unpack that a bit later on. But Paul's one thing was knowing Christ. He wanted to know Christ. Yet in City Slickers, when Billy Crystal's character gets home, he realizes something that his, his one thing for him is his wife and kids, the very thing that when he was back there before, uh, he, 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 he had so many things going on in his life that he didn't see the beauty of the one thing that was right there in his life. His family, his wife and kids, that was his one thing. They were there all along. But he was so distracted that he lost sight of the one thing. And sometimes that's exactly what we're like. We're so distracted. We're so pulled this way and that way. This thing makes a promise. That thing makes a promise. This will give you that and this will give... And we get so distracted as believers that the simplicity of faith in Christ can just become something that's kind of a... It's a hope. We hope we get there one day. I want to make time for God. I have good intention. I really want to. But I'm so distracted and so pulled away with all kinds of other things. Yet Jesus is standing there in front of us all along. Saying, here I am. Here I am. Come to me. All you who are weary, heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. I'll give you rest. One of the greatest tools of the enemy in our generation, I believe, is distraction. It's distraction. Now, it's one thing to know the one thing, but it's another thing to pursue the one thing, isn't it? We could all stand here as Christians this morning and go, yeah, I, I, the one thing is Christ. But if we look at our life, is that really true? Is that really the one thing that we're chasing after? Do we really have a passion to know Christ? See, I, I, I read in this a sense of, of Paul going, you know what, I, can't, I don't want to get complacent when it comes to my spiritual life. I don't want to get complacent when it comes to my pursuit of knowing God. Hebrews 12.1, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders, distracts, and the sin that so easily entangles us, let us run with perseverance. The race marked before us. He says, I'm going to throw away the, the sin. And we all understand sin, but he also says there's a bunch of things. They're not sinful. They're just distractions. They're just slowing me down. They're pulling me back. I reckon we've probably never lived in an age where there are more things slowing people down and holding people back from the thing that in their heart they really want to pursue. And as a church, we've got all kinds of things pulling at us. All kinds of issues and, 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 and things going on in culture, things going on in the world. That's before we even touch the personal things that are going on in our own families, in our own bodies, in our own hearts, in our own lives. But he says we've got a, a cloud of witnesses. He says we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. What he means by that is this. If you go back and you read Hebrews, he lists all these heroes of the faith. And here's the point he's making. He's saying we've got all these witnesses. We've got all these examples. These are people just like you and me who had their own pressures and their own persecutions, people who had their own troubles and their own struggles, who had their own humanity they were dealing with. But here's an example. Here's a list of people that even in the midst of that managed to somehow pursue God with all their heart, soul, mind and strength and look at the things that they were able to do in life. Look at the legacy they left behind. Look at the transformation. Look at the change that came. There are people that have done it before. Sometimes I think we tell ourselves, I I sometimes read David, and it always bugs me where David writes, he says, as a deer pants for the water brook, so my soul pants after you, Lord. I read that and it bugs me. It bugs me because I used to think, you know, once upon a time, maybe people were that passionate for God. But today, come on, God, it's a different world now. Come on, God, we've got other things to worry about, Lord. You know? How can a person really, how can you really so long for God like a deer pants for water? Come on. Isn't that a bit Hollywood, God? That's what I used to think. Isn't that a little bit Hollywood? Isn't that a bit dramatic, God? Then one day the penny dropped. Hang on a second. That was actually a real man who wrote that. And when I go throughout church history and I look at the sacrifices people have made for the kingdom of God and for the sake of God, the things that people have changed and dropped off their life, the sin they've overcome, even the hindrances and the distractions they've pushed aside just to get to know God. All of a sudden, I'm confronted with the fact that I can't, I can't look at that and go, God, that's not attainable. 
I've got to look at that and go, okay, God, if, if that's attainable and that's real, now I examine my own heart and go, okay, Lord, where, where do I stand with you? It's one thing to come to church and raise my hands and sing songs about God. It's another thing to pick up a Bible every day and read a few verses and so on, but when the rubber meets the road of my life, how important, how, how, how much does it mean to me to actually know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering? It says that they ran, these people, they ran with perseverance. In other words, it wasn't always easy to put God as the number one thing. It wasn't always popular, and, and a lot of them didn't see instant results. It wasn't about seeing instant results, but they pursued it anyway. So don't wait till you're 18. If you're a young person in this room, don't wait till you're 18 to decide to make Jesus your one thing. Don't wait till you're 21. Don't wait till you finish school. We've always got this, we've always, I, I find human nature is we've always got this next thing. When I get over that, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like when, 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 you know, you think about, uh, uh, let me give a practical example that's close to people's heart, money. Uh, look, I, I, yeah, I do want to give to the kingdom, but you know, I just want to make, once, once we pay for that, then we'll start being generous. And then we pay for that, and there's something else that's always there. Well, once, once, once we pay off that, Lord, then we'll start investing in the kingdom. Well, once, once we do that, I'm, I'm, I want to pray, Lord, I do want to sit at your feet, I do want to speak to you, and I want to hear your voice, Lord. But, but God, this week's real busy, so, but when I, do, I just want to get through this week, and when I get through this week, then I will, and we get through the week, and what happens? Hey, something else pops up, because life doesn't stop just because you want to chase God. Life doesn't stop just because you want to reprioritize things. The rest of your world doesn't go, oh, you don't want to prioritize me anymore, I'll back up a little bit. No, it doesn't. You know what it does? It screams and yells louder, going, hey, we're not going to let go of you. We're just as important as that. What makes that so special? Well, that died on a cross for my sins 2,000 years ago, and because of that, I have eternal life. Because of that, I have a lot of things that I wouldn't have because of Christ and what he did for me. Don't wait till you finish school or university. Don't wait till you're retired, till you focus on the one thing. And don't wait till you're standing face to face before him. And one day we go, oh, wish I had a focused a bit more on the one thing when I was down there. I wonder what you and me could have done, Lord. I wonder what difference we could have made. Philippians, he goes on, verse, chapter 3, verse 12 to 14, he says, not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. I love the humility of Paul. I'm not there yet. Hands up if you're not there yet. I'm not there yet either. I'm not there yet. And Paul humbly admits, hey, this ideal I'm, I'm aiming for, he says, I'm not there yet. I haven't got there yet. But... But rather than just make excuses for why I'm not there, rather than come up with reasons why I can't get there, he says, I do this thing. He says, I press on. I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, and this is what I want to get to and start to unpack over the next few weeks. He says, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. What's the it? Knowing Christ. I'm not quite there yet, right? This is the goal. I want to know Christ. He says, I don't consider myself to be there yet. I'm still a work in progress. I'm still going towards it, but I'm, I'm pressing on. I'm striving to take hold of it. But one thing I do, he says, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. Paul says, Christ Jesus took a hold of me, but also that I press on. When we got saved, Christ Jesus took a hold of us. But Paul says, it's not just about that. It's not just about Christ getting a hold of you. Now he's got a hold of you. Your part is now you've got to press on. Now you've got to press on. Now you've got to strain for the prize. Now you've got to go forward. Now you've got to forget the things that are behind you and move forward. Salvation is not the only goal. Otherwise, why is Paul saying he's still pressing on toward the goal? See, for Paul, the goal was not salvation. The goal is knowing Christ. It's growing deeper in my relationship with him, in intimacy with him, becoming more of who he wants me to be, seeing more of what he saved me for, what he called me to himself for, and living my life down here, this tiny pinprick of a life. And that's all it is. It's a crack in a wall. It's here today and it's gone tomorrow. And I don't know whether my tomorrow is tomorrow or in a month or a year or five years or 10 years. What I do know is this. I'm 52 years of age now and I'm amazed how quick that 52 years went. And I look back at that 52 years and I go, man, I was so distracted for a lot of those seasons. So distracted, God. And if I could have that time again, Lord, here's what I would do different. This, this, this. And I believe God looks at me and goes, son, that's beautiful. But guess what? You're not getting it back. 
You're not getting it back. You're not getting it back. Salvation is not the goal. Jesus never said get saved. He said become a disciple. Become a follower, an apprentice. Walk with me. Walk with me. Grow in me. Paul speaks of a goal that he's trying to reach. In order to reach it, he has to keep moving forward because he hasn't actually arrived at that goal yet. Listen to his discontentment, his spiritual sense of discontentment. I'm not there yet. I haven't arrived. I know there's more, but I'm pressing and I'm straining. And I don't want to get complacent with my pursuit of the goal. And it makes me ask the question of myself, Alan, have you got complacent in the pursuit of the goal? Have I got complacent in the pursuit of the goal? And I throw that question at you this morning. Have you got complacent in your pursuit of the goal? Have you got complacent in your pursuit of Jesus? I believe with all my heart, Australia, I believe that we are on, we, we are seeing the beginning gentle breezes of something amazing that God wants to do in our country. We've got that song we've been singing the last few weeks, The Great Awakening. I don't, I don't believe that's just a song. I, I, I believe with all my heart. I believe with all my heart that's a prophetic declaration. And if you don't know the song, go home, Spotify it, YouTube it, whatever you do, The Great Awakening, and listen to the words of that song. There's something about to happen in our country. I think the Holy Spirit, there's been prayers for decades, prayers for decades by faithful men and women of God who have prayed in, in, in what has looked on the surface in our nation to be a very dry season. But I believe that their prayers are going to start to come to fruition. And I believe you can feel that. You can sense that. I don't know about you, but, 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 but I, I see the spiritual hunger in some of God's people. And I go, man, that's, that's not a work of the flesh. Your flesh doesn't want to kill itself. It's not pressing into God. Huh? Flesh doesn't want to kill itself. It's not the devil. It's not the devil. He doesn't want you pressing into God. That's the Holy Spirit. That's a work of the Spirit. Sometimes we think a work of the Spirit is everybody going, Rah! hanging off chandeliers by their feet, speaking in tongues and falling over every time you prayed for. And you know, We've got all these outward manifestations of what we think. If that's happening, it's the Spirit. If that's not happening, there's no Holy Spirit. I, don't, I think they're secondary. The real work of the Spirit is in the human heart where the Spirit dwells. And when we're getting hungry and passionate for the Spirit in our own lives, our hunger for prayer is building, our, our passion for His presence. We're reminding ourselves throughout the day, He's with me. We want to get together, not because it's some religious requirement on a Sunday. We want to be with other people because I want to join my worship with your worship and I want to make Jesus the King of kings and Lord of lords in this space. I want to get into the Word of God. I want to see what these ancient writers wrote. I want to know how it applies to my life. It's not some religious thing that I'm doing. I, you want to be there. And when you start feeling like that, you know you, you, the, the, what's going on in here. It's the Holy Spirit in you, calling you, draw, driving you, calling you forth. Come on, press in, press in, press in. And here's the thing, I think that revival, I, I'll use the word, I think revival is going to come to our country, I do believe that. We've had several revivals in the past, I believe we're on the verge of something else happening. But here's the thing, the foundation of that is, is that each of us as believers come back to the basic and the simplicity of our faith in Christ. We've all got to ask ourselves the question, sometimes we sit there and we go, we want revival and we're praying out there for revival, God do something, do something, do something, and God's going, I dwell in you, how about you cooperate with me, let's start in there. Because if I do something in there, and I do something in there, and in there, and in there, and in there, and in there, 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 then you guys all come together, man. What can God do? What can God do with, with, with a church? I, I used to pray. I, I, I used to pray all the time when I first got saved. I used to say, Lord Jesus, you know, be to us the church you were to the book of Acts. Is my prayer. You know, signs, wonders, miracles, healing. God be to us. I stopped praying at the day the Lord said to me, I'll be the church, I'll be the God to you that I was to the church in the book of Acts. When you, you be to me the church I had in the book of Acts. I stopped praying it then. <laughs> <clears throat> yes, Lord, you make my mother in law that church, God. You work in her life. <clears throat> God's going, No, it's you. It's you. It's you. Imagine a, a faith community where everybody just made the decision. You know what, God? It makes sense that you would be my one thing. It makes sense that pursuing you, Lord, with all my... Jesus said this, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, the second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, don't get so weird and wacky that it's only God, 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 and you forget people. That's, that, that's, that's, that's not right. That's just weird. People that lock themselves away and just want to be with God, and it's just me and God. First time God said something wasn't good was when it was just man and God in a perfect world. Didn't get any better than Adam and, and, and God in Eden. Didn't get any better than that, and God said it's not good. Right? But still... 
Still, he said the first commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. Go after me. Pursue me. Make me the one thing in your life. See, life throws at us two great opportunities. We can live for that which promises us an eternal reward, or we can live for that which promises us instant gratification. And unfortunately, most people in the West live for the second. We live for that which gives us the most instant gratification, not that which gives us an eternal reward. What are, what are we living for? What are you living for? Which of those two options best summarizes your life right now? Not the life you want. Not the, no, sometimes we tell ourselves, don't we? Sometimes we tell ourselves what we want to hear ourselves. We tell ourselves the ideal. You know? this is who, sometimes when you do personality profile questionnaires, you go, okay, who do I want to be? The person I want to be would tick this box, so I'll tick that. The person I want to be would give that answer, so I'll give that answer. And guess what comes out? Oh, I'm the person I want to be. Isn't that amazing? Go back and do it again and do it honestly. And all of a sudden we go, ooh, I'm not the person that I want to be. We don't look for solutions and help in life until we realise there's a problem. First part is diagnosing a problem. Took my wife to the doctors, and that's what they're doing right now in the hospital there, and they're, they're, they're diagnosed. The first thing you've got to do is diagnose the problem. And once we know what the problem is, then they can apply an effective, actual, real solution to whatever the problem is. Part of the problem with Christians, I think, is the truth is we don't want to, we don't want to admit the problem. We want to blame everything else. We want to blame our husband. We want to blame our wife. We want to blame our upbringing. We want to blame our pastor. We want to blame our church. We want to, we want to blame our parents. We want, to, we want to blame everybody else. And everybody else may have had a contributing factor to where my life is right now, but at the end of the day, I've still got choices I can make. I've still got choices I can make. I'm very quiet here. Sometimes we're just so stretched and so mentally and emotionally and physically tired from life that we just want instant gratification and relief. Well, Paul knows the goal. It's knowing Christ. And Paul's not letting himself get complacent. He says, I'm pressing, I'm straining, and I'm striving. Then he gets to that one big lesson that he's learnt. As he strained and strived to push forward to pursue the goal of knowing Christ, he said, but one thing I do. He says, forgetting what's behind. And straining what's ahead. Here's the reality. If you, wanna, if you want what's up ahead, then you're going to have to let go of what's behind. In order to see what's up ahead, you're going to have to stop looking at what's behind. And for many people, the biggest hindrance to moving forward is not what's in front of you. It's what's behind you. It's what's behind you. So what does Paul mean by forgetting what's behind? He doesn't mean erase from your memory. Some things are near impossible to forget. Other things are too painful to forget. And some things are too good to forget. What he means is stop focusing on those things. Put Christ at the front of our vision. He uses the analogy of a runner. And if you're running in a race and you look back over your shoulder, you're going to stumble. You're going to lose direction. You're going to lose momentum. We need to know what we need to leave behind if we're going to move forward in our Christian journey and our pursuit of the one thing. We need to know what we need to stop focusing on in order to see what's up ahead. I want to get the musos to come back for me. I want to finish with that song, Gratitude. So Paul's one thing was knowing Christ. Simple challenge this morning. Simple thought for you to walk away with. What's your one thing? My one thing has fluctuated and changed in seasons of life. But here's the thing. Whenever Christ has been my one thing, life has always been better. It hasn't always been easier. It hasn't always been more comfortable. I haven't always been the most popular. I haven't always been the most rich or the most successful. But when Christ is first, my life has always been better. Always been better. Over the next few weeks, we're going to look at a few things in our past that I think we've got to forget in order to move forward. Past sins. Past hurts. Past identity. Past mistakes. And then finally, the way it used to be done. But today, have you got complacent? Have you lost your first love? Making the main thing the main thing is actually the prerequisite for everything God has for you in life. When the main thing's the main thing, then everything else God has for you could fall into place. When the main thing's not the main thing, then you're hindering everything that God has for you. 
Jesus worded it this way in Matthew 6.33. We all know this. He said, seek. Seek first the kingdom of God. And his righteousness. All these other things will be added to you. We get it the wrong way around, some of us. We seek first all the other things and hope that God adds the kingdom. God says, it doesn't work like that. You seek me first. You seek me first. And it literally means first. It means first in order, first in priority. You look at the Greek word, first in priority, first in order, first in order of importance. He says, you seek me first. You make me number one. You return to your first love. He says, if you will do that, my promise to you is everything you need. I don't care. He doesn't even waste time breaking the needs down. He just says, everything you need. Everything you need. Whatever is essential for you to thrive in this life, whatever is essential for you to be the person I've created you to be, whatever is essential for you to achieve the things I put you here on earth to achieve, whatever is essential to your life, if you put me first, this is the challenge Jesus says, I will, I will, I will bring all that to you. I will bring it to you. When I bring it to you, I will get the glory for it. And when I bring it to you, no one will take it from you. But you have one thing, one thing, one thing. Seek first. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God. Let's stand again. I'm, I'm sure here this morning there are some people here and You've probably never sought God first. Maybe, you, maybe you're here this morning, you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've never, ever surrendered your life to Him. 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ died on a cross for you. The gospel message is very simple. There's this thing called sin. We inherited it, and it blocks us from having a relationship with God. We've got two options. We either live an absolutely sinless, perfect life, dot every I, cross every T. By perfect, I mean not human standards. I mean by God's standards. And His holiness is way higher than ours. So high, in fact, it doesn't matter how good you are, you'll never reach it. You can either back yourself and go, no, I'm pretty good. But one day you're going to stand before God. And He's going to probably say to you, not probably, He will say to you, doesn't matter how good you did it, weren't good enough. How do I know that? Because every Christian in this room will say the same thing to them too. Because it's not by our works that we're saved. But God so loves us that he had to come up with a solution. Somebody has to die. Blood has to be shed. Without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. There has to be a penalty when a crime's broken. There has to be a punishment. We understand that in our natural world. And when there's not a punishment, we get an uproar, don't we? We get angry. We get our justice side rises. That person should be punished. Where do you think that comes from? It's the same in the kingdom. But what God did is he sent his son, Jesus. God knew we couldn't reach up to him, so Jesus was God's effort to reach down to us. And Jesus Christ was crucified on a cross, not for anything he did wrong, but for everything you've done and everything I've done. And then God extends us the invitation. He says, you put your faith in him. I'll consider his death to be your death. And one day when you stand before me, I'm going to say, enter into your rest, my son and my daughter. Maybe you're here, you've never given your life to Jesus. There's the gospel message in a nutshell. It's your choice to accept Christ or not. But whatever you do with that message now is a choice. Don't kid yourself and think, I'm not sure. It's a yes or a no. It's not a yes or a maybe, and maybe it's a no. Maybe you're here today and you know at one point in your life you were passionate about Christ. It was your number one thing, but you know you've drifted. You know you have. Not because you're a bad person or an evil person. You're just a human. And if we don't keep resetting those navigation markers in our life, it's so easy to drift passion for Christ isn't there. You don't care about prayer anymore. You don't care about the Word of God. Coming to church is more of a chore. But you still got your faith. you still got that spark in there. This morning, I want you to cry out to God. I want you to say, God, forgive me. God, I want to come back to my first love. Because if I seek first the kingdom of God, everything else gets added to me. God, I'm sorry. I've been chasing everything else and not seeking you. I want these guys just to play this song. Let's just sing this, this, this chorus through once or twice. Then I'll pray for us. And why don't you just do business with God where you are right now? Just you and the Holy Spirit. It doesn't matter about people. When you walk out of here, you're not going to walk out of here with my hands on you. You're going to walk out of here with a relationship with Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Well, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, would you just continue to speak to us, God? Would you continue to draw us back to our first love? Lord, would you continue to 
Lord, when we leave this place, I pray, don't let people just walk away. Don't let us walk out of here and just forget whatever it is that the Holy Spirit might be saying to us. God, I pray that we would listen to the voice. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says. And Lord, those of us whose hearts have drifted, God, not because we're bad, just life is busy. Father, would you, would you, would you put your finger on our hearts, Lord? Would you call us back? Would you help us refocus, God? Would you help us reclaim the one thing, the most important thing, and that is that we would know you, Jesus. That we would know our Lord and Savior. That we would have relationship with you, God. That we would know you are with us 24-7. That we would experience your love. That we would experience your presence, Father. That, Lord, we would readjust our life so that it revolves around you. Not you revolving around everything else. Father, we want to be a part of what you're doing, God, in our nation, Father. This wind that's beginning to blow, Father. We want you to blow here, even in this place and even in every heart in this place, God. We want to be transformed and changed, God. And Father, we can't do the, the supernatural, miraculous stuff. We can just do the practical things, Lord. We can come before you now. We can open our hearts and we can say, Lord, start here. God, start here. Start with me, Lord. Start with me. In Jesus' precious name, we prayed together. Everybody said... Amen. Amen. Awesome, awesome. Hey, God bless you guys. Listen, can I encourage you? If, if the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, why don't you grab somebody? Maybe you came with somebody or maybe there's somebody here you recognize. Why don't you, why don't you grab somebody and, and just say to them, hey, here's what I felt like the Holy Spirit said to me. Would you pray for me before I walk out the door? Just that God would solidify that, plant that seed deep in my soil because I know when I get out of here, life's going to hit me, but I don't want to forget what the Holy Spirit's saying to me. Amen. Can we do that? Awesome. God bless you guys.